sometimes you have to play dumb because there's people that are gonna feel uncomfortable with how much you know. And um, a person that knows is a threat. If you know, if you're aware of what's going on, you're a threat to those who are comfortable with things going the way they're going because of their own benefit. That's so well said. Did you learn that from your parents? Because you're only 23. Not only my parents. Well, I will say, my father was not in my life. Um, him and my mom met in Italy. Um, both Moroccan. Both Moroccan. He is from McNess. McNess is a a part of Morocco where most people are dark skinned. So my father, um, if seen on the street, you would think he's African American or just African, which still is because he's Moroccan. But you would think, um, <laughs> yeah, people are that kills me. That type of thing. oh, you're Af you're African. <laughs> But you're light. And I'm like, yes, I'm African. Uh -huh. <laughs> Anyhow, um, they met in Italy. Um, he was a syndicate. He, he was helping um, Moroccan immigrants get their, what we would call a green card. Mm -hmm. it, it's called something else in Italy. But he helped my mom with her paperwork and they fell in love. Um, at the time, my mom was in a contract marriage. Oh, so she was right. paid. Traditional. She was paid to bring someone to Italy from Morocco. Um, therefore, when she found out she was pregnant and she was binded by this marriage, she had to pin me on someone else. She had to tell this guy that I was his daughter. So I have his last name. I don't have my father's last wow. name. I have my mom's husband at the time, last name. Everything eventually came out. Um, my father recently reappeared after about 21 years. Um, I was told Your that he was dead. Father. My biological father, yes. I was told that he was dead um, in circa 2012. And um, whenever he surfaced, I asked him about the the death joke because it was a joke. Clearly, you're not dead, so tell me what happened. He said that he had a liver transplant and he almost died. But you know how news usually leave one source right. one way and get to the other. So, wherever, right. when it and left us. My death has been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> right, so it left him as a liver transplant new and it got to me as he died. Yeah. Um, back to my mom and my dad. But liver transplants are scary. Very. He was a heavy drinker from where I was told. Oh. Yes, he's, I feel he repented of a, of a, of a Moroccan man. Oh. Yeah, right. Um, you'd be surprised. Moroccan men drink, oh. drink like sponges. They just, oh. mm -hmm. they're very good preachers. They preach good, but the practice <laughs> not so much. Anyway, so um, where did they meet your parents? In Verona, Verona Italy. Verona, Verona, oh, Verona is about um, yeah. maybe 45 minutes west of Venice, 45 oh, to an hour. Beautiful. You That's where I was there? born and raised. Yes, I was born in Verona and I stayed there until I was 18. Um, when I was 18, I got married to Ricardo. We'll get into that. Uh, I grew up locally. I went to local schools. Um, I graduated high school in advance. Lo because, local, um, like public school or yes, Muslim school? No, I was in a public uh, Italian school. There were no... My mom never really practiced mm. Islam. She introduced me to everything, kind of. She made sure I knew what our religion was, but never made me feel like I had no choice, right. you know? She said, whatever you do, what matters is your heart. If you're a good person, no one is gonna care what your religion is, Right. you know? Um, and I, I'm so thankful for that, because nowadays, um, there's such misconception uh, when it comes to religion. Not only Islam, just religion, oh, yeah. period. It's just, it's huge. It's misused, misunderstood, um, abused all the time. We see these things every day, and we hear of them every day, especially being a Muslim living in America. Um, so 
So I grew up there. Uh, when I was about 17, I met Ricardo, which would end up being my husband. Um, Is he we Catholic? Were, he is Baptist. Baptist? Yes. We were in Verona? very much in love. He's The way we met, um, he was in the U.S. Army. He is in the U.S. Army. And there's a uh, NATO bases in Italy. There's one in Vicenza. And there's a couple more throughout Italy. Um, we met. We were madly, madly in love. Just How crazy. old was he? He was 20 and I was almost 18. Wow. So there's two, two and a half years difference. Um, so we were like, okay, what are we going to do? You're eventually going to have to go back to America. I can't go because although I was born and raised in Italy, I was still a Moroccan citizen. And for a Moroccan citizen to get to America, it's kind of tricky. So we were like, what are we going to do? And he goes, I'm going to marry you. And I go, listen, I'm, no. I'm too young. I didn't, I, I'm not ready. He was like, listen, the only way we can be together is if we get married. Not only for the... Not only for immigrational purposes, but also religious-wise, re religion-wise. Um, me being Muslim, my family, although my mother, like I said, doesn't practice, the rest of the family did, and they were very judgmental. Therefore, they would have never accepted you me, being a Baptist. me seeing a Baptist or being anything other than a Muslim that marries a Muslim or marries who they tell you to marry when they tell you to marry them. <laughs> But my mom was very happy. Uh, my mom was happy. She, she liked him. She liked, she loved him. And does until this very day. She agreed to meeting him. So we met. They met. And after that, uh, we started to plan, you know, how we were going to go about the marriage, you know, paperwork and everything. So the first thing that we needed was a marriage license. Um, someone had to sign off saying, okay, they're, they're not they're not currently married. They are okay to get married. It's something very simple that you get in a matter of a half a day in any courthouse in America. But being that I'm Moroccan, I had to contact the um, Moroccan embassy and set up an appointment. So at the time, they don't know who I'm trying to marry why I'm trying to marry them. All they know is that I'm coming for an appointment for a marriage license. So I come in, it's me, my mother, and Ricardo. And and he's 20 at this he's, time? At the time he's 20 years old, yeah. yes. So we get in and Was he they start- Was army? Yes, yes, that's how, that's how we ended up in Italy. So they start asking us questions and they start speaking Arabic to him, thinking that, that you don't know. That, thinking that he's Moroccan or another Arabic country. And I go, no, he doesn't speak Arabic. And they're like, what does he speak? I say, he speaks English. And you can see the the air in the room change. The air got heavier. It was heavy. It, it was. Did he look Moroccan? You could feel tension. Before My husband is black. Huh? My husband is black. He did not oh. look Moroccan. They were, I don't know, but like I said, my father is black, but he's Moroccan. So then, you I know. I saw plenty of black people in Morocco. Exactly. So they assumed, you know, that and he, he was, was Moroccan. just Moroccan. And they started talking. I was like, he doesn't speak. So they were like, why does he speak English? And I go, he's American. These people didn't uh, even let uh, me uh -huh. go on with the appointment. Yeah. They said, there's no way we're going to give you, there's no way we're going to take such a responsibility, such as releasing a marriage license for a Muslim girl to marry a non-Muslim, let alone a non-Muslim that serves in the U.S. Army. Um, they were very nasty. They were very nasty. And um, I was pregnant at the time. I didn't know, but I was pregnant. And it took a huge toll on me. Um, we didn't know what to do anymore. I started to think that our relationship was going to be over. They made it sound like it was going to be impossible for us to get married. What, what, where was your mom at? Right time? there. Emotionally. She was, she was 
Oh, she was super supportive of us. She has always been. Um, I'm an only child, so it's like my mom lives for my life. Um, as every mom is supposed to. Not only, not only, only children, mothers, all mothers. Right. And she knew you were in love. She knew I was in love. She knew I was pregnant, and she wanted me to do what I wanted to do. She wanted me to be happy. And um, they didn't care about happiness. They cared about the fact that I was Muslim and he was not. So we're thinking and, and thinking, US, and he was in the US. That's what killed them. That's what really bothered them. They were like, how could you? He kills your people for a living. I said, what people? Who's my people? I don't know what you're like, who's supposed to be my people, you know? I, I I I didn't even want to get into that that depth right. conversation with them because I could see that they were not worth it. A person that comes off so nasty for no reason, in my opinion, doesn't deserve uh, a conversation of a certain That's level. Such depth. Your wife's that way. There was, there was, because I remember I, being in Kashmir for two weeks, really living with Muslims, and at one point they said, where are our Saudi brothers? This is supposed to be Islam, the religion of brotherhood. Why yeah. are none of them helping us? Is there Islam is a religion, it's based on love and not fear. Um, we believe in love and brotherhood and happiness and relief and healing. None of the things that we are pictured as. Right. We're pictured as killers and rapists and terrorists and all of these things that true Muslims are not. You know? Islam is about love and, and forgiveness more than anything. Forgiveness. It's a religion where if you have a guest, you're supposed to sleep on the floor and give up your bed. You know, right. taking it back to you know ancient years and everything. If you have a guest, they, they eat. You don't. You know, if it came down to it. So we're not we're not like that. But it's uh, I think it's too. Sometimes I don't think it's too late. Sometimes I feel so overwhelmed. But I feel it's not even worth trying to explain to people what my religion is really about. Sometimes I just pretend that I know nothing about it. Sometimes I just say I'm of Muslim descent and I know nothing about it to avoid the discomfort and um, avoid the discrimination, which is very real. Right. Very real. Right. Right. Um, I met guys that would tell me they're from a different country just to not say they're from Yemen or Kuwait or, you know. They say, oh, I'm from Pakistan. And I say, you know, you don't have to lie to me. I'm just like you. I'm your sister. I'm a Muslim too. And I understand why you're doing this. I understand why you, you're hiding. And this happened to me about three weeks ago at a drive through tobacco shop. Can we go? Like one of please, Thank you. So, that's okay. We'll just, part of the deal. Yeah. We have the background. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. Yeah. It's very um, original. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so. No, this is actually the purpose of our document see if this can be addressed. How do you how do you chip away at it? I would love to um, you know get in depth and actually like get in depth, sorry, and actually talk to people about this. You know? Right. Because I know I have sorry, I have experienced this on my own skin and I want people to know that it is okay to feel this way. They're not the only one that feel like this. You're not the only one to feel like it's not okay for you to be Muslim. It's not okay for you to be yourself, you know? And it, it's it's not just for Muslims. It's that way for Muslims. It's that way for the LGBT, LGBT community. It's that way for the African American community in America. It's that way for um, out of shape people, whether it be anorexic or obese, it's the world we live in. 
seems like it's designed to make you feel like you're not okay. Right. When really you're okay. You're you are your own person. You don't have to. And that's to. what all the religions are saying. God loves you. God loves he's you your no father. Father. matter he's your what. Mother. You know, he's you have to you have to understand that you're not here to accommodate nobody else's need but yours. You're not here to make anyone happy but you. You know? You came here alone and you're gonna leave here alone. So please take care of you while you're here. Cause when you're gone, nobody's gonna remember. Nobody. No matter how much they loved you while you were here. It's part of life. We have to learn how to love ourselves. Whether it's religion, whether it's sexuality, whether it's taste, whether it's politics, you're just general beliefs. You have to learn how to be comfortable with who you are and stop trying to be what you think others want you to be or what you think is okay to be. No, it's okay to be you and that's it. I don't even want to talk to me. I don't even know what to like me. What are you gonna like me for? What, what is it gonna do for me? So your husband's name again is Ricardo. Ricardo. Where was he born? He was born and raised in South Carolina. Uh-huh. Yes. He's um both mom and dad were Baptist, very religious people. Um his father was a mechanic. Um, he passed a couple years ago, unfortunately. Um, Did you meet him? Yes, I got the chance to meet him for a whole year. And um, it was a great experience. Great man, uh, very loving, God-fearing man. Um, won't do wrong if he had to. Um, he opened up a whole different um, eye that I didn't know I had and I started seeing people in a different way. It'll come back. It turns. Yeah, I'll just pause it now. So how did you uh, resolve the thing since the Moroccan embassy was so uncooperative because you were saying you were crying? So, it started out the the immediate days after the fact just was me crying my eyes out to every person I see and telling them, look, they don't want me to get married, I'm pregnant, and I have in love, we want to be with each other, we're supposed to leave together, and maybe by the 15th or 20th person I cried to, someone said, but you know, being that he's in the military, you can do a double proxy marriage, and I had no clue what a double proxy marriage was, it looks like it's a double proxy marriage, so a double proxy marriage is um, in the event that um, a, a couple is not able to attend their wedding, but still need the fact of their wedding documented, you can authorize a third party on both halves for a fee, of course. I think mine was 850 or something. It was about that much. And um, for two lawyers? Yes, it was. Um, it's a it was a package. There is many many ones because you know some people do it while their spouse, the fiance, is deployed or they live in a different country or um, so it's usually it, in the case of pregnancy right the when they man went, is overseas if the man is overseas um, as long as he's in the military you can do the double proxy I don't know if the double proxy marriage is um, available accessible to um, civilians I'm not sure I, I would hate to tell something is wrong but I remember Remember, check it out. I will. I'm gonna try to. Um, our proxy marriages. Access. Actually, could you pull that down? Oh no, there is something to pull down. It's um, it's a light. It's, a, it's I think it's off now. Yeah. Um, underneath your seat or under the legrest. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah, 
that's okay. So it is only for military and two lawyers on your behalf go to the courthouse, get the marriage license the first day, go marry you on the second day. Within five business days, you have your marriage license, marriage license and certificate. Um, I was so happy, and at that by that time, by that time, I was so desperate that I think I thought it wasn't true. I thought it wasn't possible. I thought me and my man was never going to be able to be together. Because you were sort of psychologically abused at the embassy. Yes, very much so. Insane. I, I don't um, wish that upon no one because it was very what about embarrassing. Love? They don't care. They, they, they don't. So it's so religion is more of a political thing. Not it's more of a political thing. Even though thing. it's all about it's not, love. Like, yes, yeah, because, about because religiously wise, where they messed up so much, all they had to say, which they didn't even bring it up, was what the Quran states. And the Quran states that if you want to marry a Muslim woman, you must convert. They never, not once, brought up him converting, which he was willing to do. All they had to say was that he was a killer. And he was he was killing my people. He killed them for a living. When they didn't even know if my husband ever really been anywhere, which he did, but still that was so wrong of them. So wrong of them. But here we are, five years later. We will be celebrating five years of So you marriage. really had to stay in your truth, didn't you? It was, it was, it was rough, it was hard, um, and then, you know, he, he lived on a military base, and being that I was a Moroccan citizen, I couldn't get on, I couldn't even get a pass, uh, after my marriage certificate came, they wanted us to legalize it before they would give me an ID to access the military base, um, we spent lots of money to get a green card so I could come to the United States. Which was understandable. Um, that's just protocol. It's normal. Everybody goes through it. Um, they're helpful. I don't think anybody has ever been that nasty to me. And I've been through a lot of things, as young as I am. But I don't think anyone was ever that unsensitive and un. In do you say inconsiderate or un inconsiderate of others' feelings? Sensitive. It was just. Oh, I Maybe. love the lift off. Do you like the lift Yeah, off? I like it. <laughs> that Look. Can you see? We're leaving Casablanca. Bye, Morocco. us but they didn't they couldn't stop us um, now this was happening in 2012 2013 ish now me and Ricardo have two beautiful children Tiana and Calvin Lee Aww. and um, we all live in South Carolina where in South Carolina um, Sumter it's about Sumter, 45 Fort Sumter? Mm -hmm. Fort Sumter well Fort I think Fort Sumter is actually in Charleston uh -huh. but Sumter or it could be there, but um, we've been there for a while and we're all good, and this is us. a big shock yeah that's a whole nother story oh, right there, there. Um, unless, unless you have more to finish up. no that that was pretty much it um yeah. he has Ride been eyes out hmm? the 15th person about the time i got to the 15th person they was like go to this website you'll be married by next week and i could not believe it i couldn't i just could not believe it it was so good i was so happy i was you know it's a, it's a service that they offer and they're a business so it's not done on a personal level yeah. but i was emailing them like they were my friend like thank you so much and yeah. it was like automated emails that were yeah, coming right. i was like thank you thank you to the robot <laughs> 
I was happy. I just got really happy thinking about it because I was so relieved. Imagine being deeply in love with someone, knowing that you found the love of your life and someone telling you, no, no, you cannot be with them. Right. You, will, you will not be with them. Officials. Officials. Yeah. Officials, yes. Dun, people dun, that dun, people dun. Love. <laughs> bureaucrats. <laughs> but no, they didn't they didn't do it. And now now they kiss behind when they when whenever I if I go to the embassy to say renew my passport and he's with me, they're all nice to him. Hi man, how you doing? But these are the Different. embassy in the States, not in Italy. Ah. So maybe Oh, so they were nasty in Italy. Yeah, this so was in Italy. They didn't go back to Morocco. No, 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 no. Uh -huh. No, they would have been great to him in Morocco. They would have. Yes, Morocco. I don't know. I just think like they were very ignorant. I just think it was a bad batch at the, around that point in time. They had a bad batch at the bad embassy. Bad batch because, ambassadors. Yeah, that was terrible. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. I said I want to speak to the ambassador, and it was like, there's nothing he can do for you. Like I thought I, as a Moroccan living abroad, have the right to speak to the ambassador if I wish. No. They wouldn't let you? No. No. So they, maybe he never even knew this was going on. I'm sure he didn't. Because I, I with time, I uh, grew to learn that Morocco and America have a great relationship. They're on great terms. Um, there's no bands, there's no blacklists that one or the other is on as it's, it normally is with other countries. So it just, it just, at the time I didn't know. If at the time, as an 18 year old me, I knew as much as I knew now, I would have pushed this to the, ex like the furthest extent I could. Because I know there's other females or men, males, in the case that you were telling me about, you know, that I know there's people that go through this. And, you know, with the knowledge that I now have, I would love to help people that are going through things like this. Right. right. I would love to. Right. So now tell me about the, the family when you go to South Carolina. So, imagine you have a son. And he goes off to the service. And he's the last son you had. So, you're, so you're old, your, your latest child is almost 17. Or 20, I think, and you have another one. So it's a baby. No one lives with you anymore. You have a little baby, which would be Ricardo. Wow. So she, she had to watch him go off, go to the army, go overseas. And she had to watch him come back with a wife and a daughter. So it was, now I understand that it was rough for her, but at the time it was rough for me. Because she couldn't accept me, and I couldn't accept the fact that she couldn't accept me. Um, so the first year or so was very, very harsh. It was, it was sad because I was so far away from home and I knew no one. I had no one but him and his family. And his family wasn't necessarily accepting me. So I had to learn how to accept myself and that's where my argument comes from. I had no choice but to love myself. I had no choice but to make myself feel how I would have wanted others to make me feel. And that's wrong. You're not supposed to expect that from others. Gratification comes from self. And you supposed figured to all this out by yourself? Just in grief process? Or? Yes, just really um, being very depressed. I was very depressed. Um, I always self-medicated. Um, I refuse to take any kind of medication. Prescriptions? Yes. No, never. Um, I always just, you know, herbs. <laughs> but... Well, it's, it's a revered just, plant in many religions. Yeah. For a reason. So. Yeah, you have to go through the most in order to be able to really, really get a grip of your life and understand that you are in control and no one else is. There's, and, 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 and this is not, it has nothing to do with word, success, money, uh, material thing. No, it's just, it's really on a personal level, on a, on a spiritual level, you are in control. You control your happiness as much as you control your sadness, you know? Um, energy is real, 
soul is real all of these things that are becoming more and more common to hear about these days are all real you control your your energy field and, you know you put out a certain energy and as much energy as you put out you take in so if you're not you're not up for it when it like when it comes to negative people if you're not up for feeling that way then it's up to you to single out yourself from the bunch you know so you basically have given top priority to to know to stay close to you yeah i feel like being so far away from home having two kids at 22 my son was actually my 21st birthday gift because he was born three days before my birthday. So all those things, I found myself in a place where I had no choice but to learn. Because it was either that or I was going to lose control of my life. I was going to eventually harm myself or harm others. And it's just, I want to use the pain that thought me this to help someone else that maybe hasn't reached Right. Rock bottom like I did. Right. Yeah. Right. You know? Right. Maybe I can prevent someone from reaching hard rock yeah, bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because not everyone reacts the same. Right. Maybe I came out of it like this, but maybe the next person won't make it. Yeah. Where was Ricardo at this time? He was there. Um, you, in he, South Carolina? He was. We were actually in Virginia when we first moved to the States. We were stationed um, in Fort uh, Eustis, Virginia. Because I thought you said he was deployed to so those off the place. He was deployed um, before we were married. Oh, before? Yes, he was deployed for nine months, and we were just boyfriend and girlfriend at a time. Um, he was in Afghanistan. Um, it was rough for him, and that was around 20, 2012, where, where, when things were still pretty hectic in Afghanistan. It, it has calmed down ever since. Right. But um, it, it was live when he was there. Yeah. And, um, and that was at the beginning of your relationship. The very beginning of my relationship, That's where we amazing. didn't we didn't even really look at each other. Um, we didn't even feel like we owed each other anything yet, as far as loyalty or explanations or you know we were just friend, good, very good friends. Um, Did you have a sense of PTSD at that time? Not while he was there. Uh -huh. While he was there, he was very calm, or at least seemed to be calm. Seemed to be. Um, it didn't start showing until about three or four months after he came back. Yeah, I see. Um, and, it, and he went through such a dark time. Yeah. And I couldn't understand because at the time I hadn't gone through this yet. I wasn't disunderstanding yet. I was kind of selfish. I was 19. I had one daughter. I wasn't understanding of the things he was saying to me, you know? He was he was feeling very sad. He was feeling very lonely. He felt the way I felt in America because he was in Italy. And I had my people, but he didn't. Yeah, but he also had that PTSD from Afghanistan. Yeah, so he, when, when time to cope with that came, he didn't know how to cope with that, you know? It was just, Did the military felt like, offer him any counseling or anything like that? Yes. Um, was it helpful? He's, until this very day, he's um, followed by a behavior health specialist. Um, he, has, he has been on medication before. Um, it has been rough. There has been times where I thought I wasn't gonna be able to be with him because of it, because it was just it was so empty and dark. Right, and right, it was right. like it was like a, a piece of metal. It was just cold and gray and You're gonna like this book, War and the Soul. War right? and the Soul. Edward Tick, PhD. I will it's, write it down. Yeah. So. Even though it's been so long for my husband, Vietnam. And I didn't think that these issues would be related. Okay, I, let's find my that, notes. Reading that book was I will totally, very helpful. I will totally look into it. Yeah. What was the name of it again? War and the Soul. It's a real work of art. War and the Soul. Like this? Yeah. Okay. By, By Edward Tick. Edward Tick. T-I-C-K. And he has some very 
very interesting uh, therapies. You know, the therapist that my husband went to at the VA said that you can never heal PTSD. You can only deal with it. Learn how to live with it. Yeah, however, this book, she suggested, and I thought that's fair. I said, Joe, how come she suggested one of the most spiritual books I've ever read, which definitely says it can be healed. Because maybe she that's what she you. has to say. Yeah, that's... Maybe she has to tell you, hey, just like when you go to a doctor, I used to have seizures. I went to a doctor and he wanted me to take medication and I said, listen, I smoke pot. He was like, you know, I can't tell you to smoke pot, but that's what you should do. So he understood. Yeah. He was he was like, I cannot legally tell you, hey, pot is good for you. I'm supposed to tell you that pot is bad for you. But that's what you should do. What a crazy world. But I, I must say, reading Edward Tick's book, I can see Joe had said he didn't know what he'd do without smoking pot. But I can see that there's still psychological work to be done, otherwise it, it too can become a bandage. You know, you want to you wanna use it skillfully. But skillfully and carefully and not at the wrong time, because sometimes you can do worse by using that. You have to um, be rational. Uh -huh. You know, you have to... It's rough. Is it helpful for Ricardo, your insights, your experiences? Have you been able to... Uh... Wait, I'm sorry. What was that again? Have, have your insights helped him? We're both um, in a time of our lives where we're understanding a lot more than we did before. And uh, not only when it comes to feeling good and your soul and your body, but also relationship-wise, the, 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 the life of the relationship, you know, protecting this relationship, protecting this love. Um, if I think about it, there's been times where me and Ricardo was almost on the verge of breaking up, and we did it. And, you know, to be married at 23 and be in have already been married for five years I feel like it's major yeah it is. it's major because I, I my mom had me at 30 yeah you know my, my and my kids are already four and two and I'm 23 so I feel like just as long as you're with someone who has the right beliefs who was taught the right things about a relationship you will succeed right or not even being thought the right things because my mom didn't give me a great example when it came to relationship. She wasn't married to my father. She was married to someone else and had me. And then divorced and then got remarried and divorced and got married last year again. <laughs> so, well, I, well, I won't say- give her credit yeah, for not giving no, up. She's, no, she's not giving up. This time she's in love. Uh -huh. I can tell she's really in love. But- Fantastic. Um, I didn't have the greatest, you know, happy family example. Uh -huh. He did. He was thought not to ever give up. So whenever there's a time where I'm really, really overwhelmed and I'm like, I can't take this anymore, he's the one who holds the relationship together. And he says, my mom was with my dad until he died, and so will you. So he's. I feel so he like comes from good background. Yeah. Good, strong. Yes. He's, you want to talk about that? His yeah. Baptist versus the Muslim, how you view that? Because um, you were saying your little girl goes with her grandmother. Yeah, my daughter, uh, as Muslim as I am, which I, I believe, I believe, I, I love my religion, I love other religions, I know of my religion, and I know of other religions. But one thing I will never do is harm any of my kids. Not harm, sorry, but deprive any of my Right. Thank you. Deprive any of my kids of knowledge. Ever. Whether it's religious or, or, knowledge. Or an opportunity or to, an experience. You know, exactly. Or a community. So, so before I be the parent that says, oh, I was, I'm Muslim, so you're born Muslim. I'll be the parent that says, hey, this is your mom's religion, this is your dad's religion, there is another flock of religions, I'll tell you about them too, and let's see what, what, what do you identify with, what do you feel yourself closer to, like, nobody made me be Muslim, 
My mom doesn't practice. My mother smokes, drinks, right. so do I. But still, you know, but you read she the book, never. Correct. Yes, we all did, and, and we pray, life. and, and we, yes, absolutely. It's it's all what you make it. If you're, and not just with Islam, any religion. If you're raising your child to be scared of God, you're doing you're, you're doing you're doing so much damage. You don't. We're scared know. of God's creation, like a plant. You, you know. Exactly. You're scared of God's creation, which could be a plant, another person, an, another animal. You're you're already on the wrong path. Yeah. You know. So you and Ricardo are all in agreement on this, right? Yeah. So, like I was saying, I'm Muslim. He's Baptist. My daughter's in church every Sunday. You know. But when there's a Muslim holiday, she's dressed up. We're dressed up. You know. We do both. Why would I? You came from both, you know. So your step, your your mother-in-law. My mother-in-law. Yeah. She, she's um. She's a very interesting lady. She's very strong. Um, I feel like she motivated me a lot when it comes to living in the states because you know she lost her husband a couple years ago. She's in her so sixties. Sounds like you worked it out. Oh yes, most definitely. Uh -huh. The first year was terrible first year she would throw away my belongings and just I understand I'd probably be the same way for my son you know but now we're well over it um, I admire her a lot I am so glad we overcame our differences um, that's a that's a great sign of maturity um, because she really didn't have to get along with me Neither did I really have to get along with her, you know. She's not married to me, and I'm not married to her. I have her son. Right. And that's that. But we, we were able to work things out. And um, she, the, the reason why she motivates me is because she lost her husband. And as much as they weren't the wealthiest people on earth, she manages to take care of herself. She never called us needing anything. She doesn't, you know... I respect her. I respect her a lot, and I am so humbled by the way she acts. It sounds um, like she takes her Christianity serious. Very serious. She doesn't miss. She doesn't miss church Sunday. She probably believes that God will provide. She Always. Have to be a burden. Yes. She believes in God will make a way. I'm not worried about it. It's in God's hands. I leave it up to God and he makes a way, which is true. He always makes a way. I, I, there's been times where I was on my last dollars, my last couple dollars, believe me, and a blessing would come. And I wouldn't even know how. And um, How does the Quran say that? Let's see how I can translate Jesus it. Jesus was saying, believe it is. Yeah, so it's be very equipment. different because of the concept, you know, how you guys, Christianity and all other religions that come from Christianity, uh, you have God, which is the Father, and then you have Jesus, which is the Son, and then you have the Holy Spirit. But in Islam, it says, I'm going to say it in Arabic because I don't know how to say it in English, it says, Lem yanid wa lem yulad. He didn't give birth to no one, and no one gave him birth. He's one and only. So that's the main difference between right. our religion and the rest of the world's religion. So when you say trust, he will provide. Yes, he will. Um, they say God will bring. How do I say Health and wealth and, and all things. You get what I'm saying. So it's. It's pretty much the same, it's just worded different. Yeah. Now, the yeah. way I look at it is I believe we were all one big thing a long time ago. <laughs> because one big, lump one big lump, and then people started falling out. Well, you know what? I'm going to go and this is my religion. Then the other, well, this is my religion. Yeah. You can't be this. And that's how, and then generation after generation after generation after generation, things got added on and all these other things. But what I will say is a lot of Islam's rules, if you want to call them that, 
are logically and scientifically supported okay because let's talk about the pork for a second we all know that pork don't sweat so it it, it withholds all toxins all the things so it's unhealthy to start with but it is also very fatty very fatty meat so the world climate is different now let's go 100 years back in Africa it was probably 120 degrees every day in the shade so you go and try to eat some pork every day in 120 degree weather for the rest of your life <coughs> you're not gonna make it <coughs> you know <coughs> or sorry so the dietary laws have scientific sense not only that even um the whole concept of washing washing before you pray because you have to be clean you know? living in a certain environment with the lack of knowledge lack of medicine lack of a lot of things you try not to wash a couple times a day tell me how you feel and how that staff feels right. and it's that's even, what even praying is a, is a spiritual purification so that you can eat food peacefully not exactly. have to digest stress down exactly so it's in it's all really to cut too. That kind of chills you out reasons out right oh okay I, I'm so ready to be in America <laughs> five days five days no pot <laughs> when you asked I asked a couple Moroccans they were they were geeked about it they were like oh yeah marijuana <laughs> I was like you guys have it they're like no there's this place it's called Katama and it's in northern Morocco and marijuana grows by the field on its own without being planted without being cured it just grows the way you would fly over Colorado and see just trees and green you'd see marijuana in Katama but they don't know how to use it. they don't know how to culture it they don't know how to care for it cultivate marijuana they know how to make hashish out of it so they get the, the, the what we what we what we smoke they throw away and they get the fresh leaves the ones that stay wet and don't dry up and they use those to make hash in. Really? yes the, there's like leaves the buds, covered and the buds they throw away? apparently I, I see and it it doesn't grow the same so I'm starting to think making maybe weed in America has a little bit of help like man help man hand because well there's definitely different strains yeah because we in Morocco and in Jamaica it was not as potent it's not as strong as it was in, in the States Jamaica's and Morocco's weed are very natural ugly looking weed you know on these long stems and it's just uncured and I feel like that's why they're not so fond of it here in Morocco as much as they are in the States because maybe you know in order for something to flourish and be um, and be great the environment of the area has to be favoring the I, growth of I it. I wonder what about Lebanon they had something called because my husband has discussions about this because he was a hippie back in the day yeah. and he said that it used to be stronger he had red Lebanese hash he had Acapulco gold he had Panama red so he thinks you know they're wanting to patent things and kind of uh, control and but you know again if you experience it yourself you would be the judge but red Lebanese hash was supposed Lebanese. to be very gummy and yeah really Moroccan good. Mor Moroccan good quality hash is supposed to be gummy you know a lot of people think you're supposed to burn hash in order to be able to roll in and no real and good hash is supposed to just you, you don't need a lighter they didn't have a lighter back in the day <laughs> you get am i right just like they didn't have a grinder for yeah, yeah. you did do everything with your hands right. so yeah but you know people get into the process and change things and add stuff and it's all about the profit and it it, it doesn't it's it doesn't stay about the 
the benefits of the actual plant, uh, the, the, the things it can do for you, but it becomes about the things it can bring you, you know, oh, money. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Did, was it, it helpful for the car or not? He, he doesn't smoke. He doesn't? No. It he, makes him kind of paranoid, maybe? No, uh, he gets drug tested. Oh. Because he's still in the service. Yeah, he would love to smoke. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. Yeah, he gets... They gotta change that. I don't think they ever will. Especially for our vets. Exactly. At least for vets. At least for veterans that are no longer active duty. Yeah. It should be a must. But you know, I think I read a discussion in regards to that. Um, they were saying that, well, it could have been a troll. It could have been something fake, you know, the internet. But it was saying that someone is pushing the issue uh, for legalizing marijuana for all veterans. Yeah. And just having, you know, the VA but provide it. But it seems so unreal. It seems like a dream that will never come through. True. Oh, I'm no. sorry. But now we'll, now we'll, we'll call on all the religions to change that. Because that's not right. Then they'll say, then maybe they'll maybe care they'll, about religion. Maybe then they're afraid we're going to stop fighting. But is that such a bad outcome? That's the goal. That's, that's the, the goal. goal. And that's why marijuana is not legal. Because it would make us so happy. <laughs> God forbid. Yeah. Happy. Happy, just happy. And you know, you're relaxed and there's no anxiety and no bad thoughts and no wanting to hurt no one and no wanting to, you actually want to, you know, look out for others and just giggle, you know? Right, right. One day. One day. Yeah, we'll be here to witness it. Okay. Thank you. It was nice talking to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Praise for Edward Tick's War and the Soul. Ed Tick not only provides a fascinating look into the minds and souls of veterans afflicted by post-traumatic stress disorder, but he also illustrates how the healing, the ailment, how healing the ailment can be achieved. Gary Ackerman, U.S. Congressman. War in the Soul is a healing book that rises from the battle for the heart of this culture. Veteran souls utter the anguish of wounds for which there is no medication. Ed Tick weaves the mythic background that alone can create understanding of these living tragedies. He offers both ancient and contemporary practices that can treat the loss of soul and the traumatic legacies of war and terror. Michael J. Mead, author, Men and the Water of Life, director, Mosaic Multicultural Foundation. This is no ordinary brilliant book. It is a document that leads us to the possibility of healing from the wars that devastate so entirely that no one is safe. This book can save our lives. Dina Metzger, author, Entering the Ghost River, <coughs> Meditations on the Theory and Practice of Healing. Ed Tick has been my teacher for 20-some years. Since the Vietnam War, he has been bringing his knowledge of healing cultures to bear on PTSD. These days, the focus is too often on the strictly clinical, but Dr. Tick dares to bring in soul. If you are treating those suffering from deep trauma, or if you are a relative, a friend, or just an interested, caring person, you owe it to yourself and to your client or loved one to read this book. Frank L. Hood, retired Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force. As the world hangs in balance, Ed Tick illuminates the path that could pull humanity back from the brink. Kenny Ashubel, founder, Bioneers Foundation, author, Seeds of Change, editor, Ecological Medicine. Dr. Tick brings to the task a deep compassion for the worldwide legion of war victims. Beyond that, he brings a scholar's sense of history, a visionary's gaze into the heart of darkness, and a poet's grace to make these poignant stories of personal agony somehow affirmative of the human spirit. 
Stephen Larson, Ph.D., Psychology Emeritus, Professor Emeritus, SUNY, Director, The Shaman's Doorway and the Mythic yes. Imagination. Americans need to understand the message from our men and women in uniform whom we have sent in harm's way. They are speaking to us in this pioneering book, War and the Soul. Uh, Louise Caris Marty, Jungian analyst, author, Betwixt and Between, Crossroads, and the real Saint Nicholas. Silence perpetrates war and its consequences. Ed Tick pierces the silence around PTSD. With this book, the healing begins. Louis Free, founder, Free Radio Limited, radio host, WASN 1500 AM, Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania. Ed Tick shows us how war tears away at the souls of soldiers and how it impacts the collective soul of the world. If we all read this book, it would change the face of war in our world and inspire us to find peaceful ways to create change. Sandra Ingerman, author, Soul Retrieval. Walking through hell with his heart wide open, Ed Tick takes us on a journey of transformative power. Using history, mythology, psychology, story, and insight born of years of helping veterans, Tick allows us to bear witness to the agony as well as the healing of those who have endured the horrors of war. It is a journey from darkness through shadow and patiently, tirelessly into the light. Richard Gelthart, Ph.D., author, The Traveler's Key to Ancient Greece and the Essential Transcendentalists. And then he also has the, the uh, In Memoriam, Robert J. Ellison. The staff at Quest Books and author Ed Edward Tick would like to take this opportunity to honor Robert J. Ellison, the photographer of the remarkably evocative picture of the soldier's face on the front cover of this book. Born in 1945, Robert studied at the University of Florida and soon became known for his photographs of racial violence in Selma, Alabama, which a variety of American magazines published. He began working as a photojournalist with the photography agency Black Star and spent several weeks with the Marines at Khe Sanh, Vietnam in 1968. His work from this period includes some of the best known images from the war and some of it appeared in a Newsweek feature story. Tragically though, Robert did not live to see his pictures in print. The supply plane that was flying him back to the base camp at Keishan crashed into a hillside, killing everyone aboard. Robert was 23 at the time of his death. Robert posthumously received the Overseas Press Club Award for magazine reporting from abroad. More of his work can be found in the award-winning book, Requiem. We wish to remember Robert for his talent, his courage, and his dedication to serving the truth through his art.